Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Penn IUR session with our wonderful guest, Albert Tanhun Ha. It is always a joy to welcome back someone who has done his work here. A few years ago, Albert came in my office and said, I want to study city planning. <laughs> and I said, OK, why do you want to study city planning? And he gave me a good answer. And I said, what do you want to study in city planning? And he gave me an OK answer. <laughs> and then he was under the tutelage of the fabulous faculty here, including Tom Daniels, John Landis, to undertake a study of the green belt in around Seoul and what that meant in terms of growth management, in terms of ecosystems management and so forth. And with this successful dissertation from which he published a number of articles, he then went on to be a postdoc in Canada, no place, at the University of Calgary, yeah. uh, where he spent a couple of years, not only being a postdoc in a planning program, but also managed to get himself into a business program. And so he was teaching both planning and business and doing very well at that. And then all of a sudden he was called to go to the University of Texas or Texas yeah, it's in, yeah, in yeah. San Antonio to be a member of the city planning program where he, again, was very, very successful, rose very quickly as a very respected professor in that program. Well, guess what? His country got word of his work and they said, we need him. And there was a position that opened up in KAIST, which is the equivalent of the MIT here. And Albert was invited to give a lecture, do a job talk, to come see what he could do. And guess what? He is now an assistant professor at KAIST in the Department of Civil Engineering, where he's teaching city planning. He has its own lab. This fall, I had the lucky occasion of visiting him there, and I met his students. And he is embarking on some very interesting work about which he's going to talk about today. So let's give Alvin a big welcome home hand. Thank you. Well, thank you for the wonderful, uh, wonderful introductions and a warm welcome. Um, it's great to be back here at Penn and at my alma mater. I can't believe it's been seven years since I graduated from Penn. And um, now you know what journey that I took over the past seven years. So I'm going to um, cut to uh, the presentation today. So the topic that I'll be talking about today is um, decarbonizing cities with smart city technology in Korea. Um, I'll be also talking about some um, the, the potential is prospects as well as the limitations and caveats. Um, um, this, uh, yeah, so let's start with a problem statement. So um, I don't think I should, um, I don't have to explain the, the, uh, the, uh, the severity of the, the challenge that we face today. Um, here I've, um, this is some numbers on showing the greenhouse gas emissions of, the, of Korea and the United States um, in comparison. In 2018, um, the Korea as a nation emitted about 727.6 million metric tons of greenhouse gases, which was 149% increase from the 1990 level. And of those commissions, 86.3% came from combusting fossil fuels. In comparison, uh, in the United States in the same year, uh, the US emitted 6.7 billion metric tons of, of greenhouse gases, which was 3.7% increase from the 1990 level. And you can see that here that 75.4% came from combusting fossil fuels. Um, you can see here that the starting difference in terms of the increasing rate of the carbon uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, between 1990 and 2018 between these two countries, which reflects the rapid economic developments that the Korea um, was able to accomplish in the, uh, over three uh, decades of, of time period. Um, and now becoming the world, uh, one of the 10th largest economy in the world. Um, of these emissions, according to the United Nations report in 2022, 78% um, of world energy con consumption comes from cities and 60% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from cities as well. So this means that significant greenhouse gas reductions can be achieved by decarbonizing cities. That brings us to the next slide. And what is deep decarbonization? Um, in the article that I co-authored with Dr. David Su at MIT, who's now at MIT, was formerly at Penn, uh, we defined deep decarbonization as uh, the goals and process of achieving net zero human-related greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and in our article, we found uh, we've identified a total of five sectors, including 
building transportation, carbon sink, energy, and industry, um, and lays out um, the what sort of the roles of um, the planners can play um, to help decarbonize our cities. Here are, I've highlighted some um, the bullet points in bold fonts to what, which will, I'll be focusing my talk on today. For buildings, understanding building stocks through smart city technologies. For transportation, in, uh, enabling changes in technology and mobility to uh, promote public transit uses and uh, discourage automobile uses. And for carbon sink, improving force mitigation, uh, managing sprawl and growth to preserve carbon sinks. And for energy, increasing the speed and scale of renewable energy resource developments and um, that can help to transition to renewable energy. So while we are going through facing the existing um, crisis of climate change, our society has gone through a significant transformation, uh, what we commonly known as the digital transformation. Um, you, what, do, what I've shown you here in this infograph is um, that kind of represents how people are increasingly connected to mobile internets with the use of smartphones and all other IoT devices. So you can see here from um, the smartphone, um, currently uh, in, in 2020, about 68% of global population uh, were identified uh, as using smartphones. And this percentage is expected to reach 80% by 2025. And, of, and as for the IoT devices, Internet of Things, um, in 2020, there were 13.1 billion uh, connections of IoT devices, and by 2025, this number is expected to grow by 20, uh, uh, grow to 24 billions. So you can see here that our society is being increasingly connected to online, and all of these IoT devices and smartphones are equipped with sensors that can collect data, whether it's um, the indoor air quality, outdoor air quality, or you know, like the um, um, like the travel behaviors, we can gain a lot of useful information um, that can enlighten um, urban planning. So that brings us to the smart city. And what is smart city? Um, it can be easily defined as technology meets the city. And as defined by Albino et al. and her Harrison, um, smart city is an instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent city using internet-based technologies to collect real-time data and advanced data analytics for improved operational decisions. And the, um, the benefits, advantage of smart city in urban planning context has been well studied over the years for mitigating urban problems through optimizations and efficiency. So um, that includes optimization of transportation systems, optimization, uh, optimization of energy systems, optimization is, um, optimizations of building systems, and municipal systems and information systems. Um, of these, all the um, well identified, well studied uh, benefits of smart city, I'm going to focus on the uh, how the smart city technologies can help uh, decarbonize our cities. So, starting with the building sector. So, um, the decarbonization, um, the smart city can help to control the demand for energy uses by you know, installing something like demand responses, smart thermostats for space and water heaters, um, and also um, um, enforcing demand-based pricing for energy uses, and also some employing technological um, architecture engineering, such as automated ventilation systems, and um, the building passive and natural design using smart technologies. All of these are uh, studied to have a positive effects on reducing energy consumptions and possibly greenhouse gas emissions from building sector. And as for the transportation sector, you know, similarly, uh, and it can be smart city technology being used to, to reduce the demand for um, automobile usage through congestion pricing for toll roads, uh, demand responsive parking meters, et cetera. And it also can also optimize the traffic flows and streets um, that can, um, you know, uh, reduce the idlings and etc. to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption from um, automobiles. At the same time, it can, occur, can be applied to um, um, make the public transit uses in alternate mode of transportation like bikes and scooter more convenient uh, so, that, so people can um, ride more of those environmental friendly uh, transportation modes as opposed to um, fossil fuel based um, automobiles. And for energy sectors, um, smart city technologies are known to um, have a positive effects on 
um, helping the cities to transition to energy, um, renewable energy productions and delivery through optimizations um, from using from building smart grids, uh, distributed solar generations, um, and et cetera. And also it can use, be used to control the demands for energy through smart energy electricity pricing to conserve energy. The other sector um, includes demand response to street LED lights, smart, smart waste management, and real-time data incorporate decarbonized smart city scenario planning, etc. cetera. The case I'll be introducing you guys today is a, one of the master plan cities in South Korea that has applied um, a lot of these smart city technologies, aforementioned uh, smart city technologies uh, during the planning phase. Um, it's called the Sejong City. So there are currently 67 smart city projects across the country in Korea. Um, um, they're built at very, um, of, uh, various scales. Some are um, built as a neighborhood scale, some are city, um, some are regional scale, and some are the provincial scale. Um, the city that I'll be introducing you guys today is called the Sejong Special Self-Governing City, which was established in the year 2012. As of February of uh, 2023, it has a population of, you know, little close to 390,000. Uh, it's a master plan city by the national government to decentralize the administrative functions of Seoul. Um, I, okay, I guess I should give you a little background about uh, what this means. So in Korea, uh, more than half of the national population, little over 20 million people reside in the city of Seoul, a uh, Seoul metropolitan area which consists of the city of Seoul and the satellite city surrounding the city of Seoul. Uh, the reason for um, the demand for living in that particular region has never diminished because there's a high concentration of jobs and um, the, the, the world-class medical um, care facilities and all the top universities in Korea are located in Seoul metropolitan area. So if you have a kid, if you're, whether you, um, if you're young professionals, that's where your jobs are gonna be at. If you're, you know, have a, small you know, kids go to school, you might be better off and send your kids to school in Seoul if you wanna to ensure he, um, the, he or she gets into a good university. So there has been a strong demand for living in Seoul, um, but uh, for the national government's perspective, they want to promote a balanced regional growth. So they decided to take the easy way of starting with de decentralizing public sector jobs to a you know, newly planned city called Sejong City. So this Sejong city is located um, 80 miles away from the city of Seoul, uh, south of Seoul, um, this, which is, I um, did a calculation how far in, uh, New York is from Philly, so it's about 95.3 miles. So you get the idea how far that is. And it's a 45 minute high speed rail wire away from Seoul. Um, it takes about hour and a half to two hours on, a, um, on cars. And now after the, it's still, the construction is still ongoing, but they, they relocated um, all the government uh, public agencies down to Sejong City. Now it's home to 45 government agencies, including all the major ministries like Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Land, Transport and Infrastructure, which is the HUD equivalent of an agency in Korea, and 50 government funded research institutes. So this created a thousands of jobs in that area. And also they provide incentives to residents who used to live in Seoul um, commuting to jobs in this government sector um, to relocate down to a city of Sejong. And when they designed this building, they incorporated various smart city technologies, including um, into mobility, healthcare, education, and jobs, energy, environment, and governance, culture, and shopping, and public safety. So I'm going to be showing uh, you some examples of how they incorporate smart city technologies to decarbonize um, Sejong City. What you see here in the figure on the left is a government complex building, which is homes to uh, major, all the ministries that I've uh, mentioned in the previous slides. Mm -hmm. It has, as you can see in the figure, it has the world largest green roof. They actually have a Guinness record um, um, of 852,437 square feet of green roofs installed on top of their uh, buildings which are known to save 16% of um, energy for cooling and 10% of energy for heating. They also incorporate geothermal heating and cooling systems, as well as solar power and rainwater recycling systems. And they have a smart building energy management system to monitor the usage of um, energy, as well as energy storage system to store energy produced from renewable energy sources. 
And with all this day, all of these buildings are green building certified. The next example is the residential buildings. These are um, townhomes uh, for uh, rental units. Um, they call the Sejong Rural Net Zero Housing Complex. As you can see here, it has a solar panel on top and has a state-of-the-art um, high efficiency installations and windows installed in buildings to conserve energy. Uh, what is actually noteworthy about this particular complex is that these complexes are um, equipped with IoT sensors um, and from uh, which you can use your smartphone to monitor the real-time energy usage of these buildings. So this is kind of a prime example of smart city uh, being applied to a residential scale. And another innovations in smart city technologies uh, can be found in building materials. Uh, what you see on the left is the, the, the window panels of the water treatment plant in Sejong City. Uh, they use the dye sensitized solar cells as a window which can generate um, um, power, electricity. Uh, not enough to uh, power an entire home, but enough to um, provide electricity for the lightning in the facility on site. And what you also see on the right is the solar canopy that was installed on the water treatment planet in Dejan, uh, plant in Dejan City, producing about uh, 876 megawatts hour of energy per year. And this probably, I mean, I mean the, the image, the video of this particular um, expressway has been floating on Twitter. Um, you probably have seen that on Twitter. This is a expressway connecting Dejan, uh, Sejong City to Tejon, which is about 5.3 miles long. Um, you can see in the middle is a bike lane covered with solar, solar panels, canopy, and there's a BRT lane that can be shown on the right, um, the blue, light blue color lanes, um, and the, uh, yeah, the connecting the city of Sejong City to Daejeon City. On top of these bike lanes, they install 700, uh, 7,500 solar panels, um, uh, producing about 2,200 megawatts hours of energy per year which can power up to 600 um, households. And as you can imagine, this was a very costly project costing about 184 million US dollars. So another example of um, smart city technologies um, for decarbonization is, can be found in the surface parking lot in the Sejong Lake Park. I actually took Jeannie to this, um, this park when, when she visited in, in, in Daejeon um, in, in November. You can see here is a solar canopy installed on top of a uh, surface parking lot, which also happens to have a low impact development for stormwater management. And in, in Visity, they have a, a water collection um, a, a pond, a detention pond. All the rainwater that, that's flown um, on this on surface water are flown uh, um, to that collection point after um, filtered uh, in this little LID um, infrastructure. And this particular solar canopy facility produced about uh, 1,250 megawatts of, of electricity per year, um, which can power about 500 households. Um, on the right is the, what you see is this, what we call the expressway sound barrier tunnel. Um, so this was to mitigate any noise generated from um, cars on the expressway um, um, in, in the adjacent residential um, areas. So when they built this tunnel, uh, they decided to put a solar panel on top, utilizing this, you know, a space on top of this um, tunnel. So it's a 1.7 miles long. Um, you can see the solar panel installed on top. That produced about 1,270 megawatts hours of energy per year. Uh, that can power up to 350 households. And lastly, um, the example that I have here is the, um, the carbon sink. Um, this is kind of, uh, they, in the Sejong National Arboretum, they've said uh, they, uh, the current government installed the carbon sick pilot garden with biochar application in the soil and planting and high carbon absorbing plants. But if you know a little bit more about carbon sink, it's never enough. In the urban scale, carbon sinks are never enough to make significant contribution to achieving carbon neutrality goal at the city level. And the development impacts on natural carbon sinks are largely understood in Korea. And I'll be introducing to you one of my projects in, in the following slides. So what we can learn from Sejong City, um, it shows that planners can you know, use the underutilized space creatively for installing solar panels and other renewable energy sources. And then finding space to install solar panels can be very challenging, especially the individual property rights are strongly protected under constitutional law, which is the case of the states, but also in Korea too. 
So the planet has to have to be creative, finding space to you know, build all this infrastructure. And I think the Sejong city showcased examples, good examples of that. And also it's a city, um, this is, it's a city that shows the, um, what could be achieved through applying the state-of-the-art SETs for decarbonization at the city level. It was all possible because it was a master plan city. But also there's a lot of remaining problems, starting with the jobs housing mismatch. So only 25, about like 25.6% of working population in, in Sejong City lives elsewhere. So although they built the residential um, like apartments and everything they did to re, um, address the jobs housing mismatch, there are a lot of still good number of people still commuting to Sejong City from Seoul and other adjacent metropolitan cities. And auto dependency remains very high. So the the, the community most share, as you can see in the numbers here, the, the car, the people use car, 44% uh, of population commuters use cars for commuting. But it was also interesting is that 40% of population commute to their work on by walking. So this is kind of really interesting you know, comparison. Um, but because of the primacy of Seoul um, that I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, the commercial buildings um, are empty. So um, the, the city itself is facing a high vacancy rate of commercial buildings or at the uh, vacancy rate of 20.3%, which is far greater than the national average. And there has been no studies whatsoever on the studying the impacts of ongoing large scale developments on carbon sinks. So the limitation of current smart city approaches can be summarized into the following. The optimization of efficiency and efficiency does not always equal to energy savings, environmental protections, and greenhouse gas reductions. And oftentimes, smart city um, technologies are applied in a very fragmented micro level, and it, it lacks a city and regional level system thinking. And it tends to focus primarily on improving the hardware, as you can see in the case for um, Sejong City, such as infrastructure and buildings with, based on ICTs, uh, without fully considering these software elements, uh, which uh, should focus on improving the quality of life of city dwellers. And there has been, you know, although there's a great potential of utilizing SCTs for enhancing planning communications uh, to address decarbonization, um, I was not able to find any cases of uh, using SCTs for enhancing planning communications. So, um, then we need to further explore the potentials of SETs for city and regional level um, decarbonization. So what I'm proposing here is the, um, the um, I guess, improved, you can, you can call it a, um, a framework of called the smart urban systems for decarbonizations, uh, including trend, that and that just based on systems thinkings and also including the important element of planning um, communications to a lot of addressed a lot of these social aspects of um, smart city development. I'll explain um, more about that in the following slides. So I'm gonna give you some examples of the smart urban systems for decarbonizations um, using, um, based on my ongoing project, um, the projects that I've already done and also on my ongoing projects. Starting with the, uh, the building sector. So, um, as you can see in the figure, um, about the buildings account for a significant proportion of energy consumptions at the city level. Uh, in case of New York City, 71% of greenhouse gas emissions comes from 1 million buildings. In comparison to Seoul, about 68% of the city level wide greenhouse gas emissions comes from 560,000 buildings. So we can achieve a significant reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by focusing on finding ways to reduce energy consumptions and greenhouse gas emissions from the city level. Um, in the projects that I conducted, this is actually a, my first ever publications that I published while I was at Penn. And I did this work on this um, DOE funded project with Dr. David Su was a professor at Penn at that time uh, on an office space just right across from here. So that I had a, uh, David had a lab there. So we, um, this was my first project work, um, we worked together on um, while I was at Penn. Um, so as you probably have heard of, um, the New York City was the pioneer in adopting a, what we call the building energy benchmarking disclosure policy. So based on using the EPA portfolio manager software, um, the New York City uh, uh, 
uh, enacted a law called Local Law 84, which mandated building owners to disclose the building energy information um, to the public. So we've tracked the, um, how effective those uh, policy were in terms of reducing, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, energy consumption from building sector. The whole idea behind that uh, was to create a market for energy efficient buildings. By making this information public, um, the consumers can decide you know, uh, which building are more energy efficient than the other, and therefore um, it can incentivize building owners to retrofit their buildings to become more energy efficient and developers to build more energy efficient buildings. So in this research, we found that um, this policy contributed to reducing building energy consumptions by 14.3% between 2011 and 2014, a short, short period of time. And after, uh, since New York City, um, because of this proven uh, effectiveness, major cities across the United States started adopting similar policies. And it, it just, it didn't stop there. In 2019, Vancouver in Canada adopted similar policies. In 2020, City of Seoul adopted similar policies. So what we can learn from that is, this study is that the information based on data analytics is key to decar decarbonizing building sector. But the challenge has been um, benchmarking like smaller residential buildings. You know, it's, it's almost impossible to get uh, energy data from these individual buildings, especially if it's owned by um, um, the individuals. So basically, I had an idea on like, can we use SETs then to benchmark smaller residential buildings to yield similar uh, positive outcomes that we see witnessed from the case of New York City? So this is a recently funded project. Um, so uh, it's entitled Small Residential Building Energy Benchmarking in Lempeng District in Seoul, South Korea. So we partner with uh, our lab, partner with a uh, company who has owned a couple of properties in smaller residential units that looks like these in Umpeng District and happened to benchmark the buildings, um, had like four or five benchmark buildings, had all the energy information and utility information. And we started collecting the building characteristics of the adjacent buildings by uh, and using the machine learning based transfer learning methods. We're trying to predict um, the energy um, 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 portfolio of the building, adjacent buildings to kind of test whether that could be a way to uh, benchmark smaller scale um, buildings. So we plan to do this uh, over the next two years. Hopefully I can report back to you um, the, 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 what we've discovered from this project. So I want to talk about, then I want to uh, move on to the next topic of carbon sinks and urban growth. Um, this is, I'll be, um, and I should probably uh, talk about, started with the good old fashioned cost of sprawl argument. So development versus preservation. And uh, I became really interested in this particular topic, um, larger from inspired by my advisor, Professor Tom Daniels and, and, and um, Professor John Landis. And um, as did Dr. Bob Burchell in, at Rutgers University um, published his work in 1998, he noted that the um, low density sprawling development patterns have, are very costly, starting with the you know, in, um, increasing dependency on automobile imported oil, which has the direct impacts of um, increasing greenhouse gas emissions and also exacerbating air and water pollutions, increasing the loss of wildlife habitats, farmland, forest land, and increasing the cost of providing extensive infrastructure and community services. So these are well studied, you know, the cost of sprawl argument. Um, and oftentimes this is faced with, you know, opposition side arguing that, you know, yeah, we get that, but also the, with then, doesn't that in sprawling development, low density um, development um, can help address the housing affordability issues by creating, you know, affordable housing stocks on the exurbans and urban periphery areas. But I argue that, um, there's a hidden cost that the planners has not really fully assessed. So the increase the loss of wildlife habitats and farmland and forest lands also means the loss of opportunities for carbon sink and storage. So I had a privilege to, um, and there's a well-documented effects of carbon sinks on land, um, which starting with, you know, forests being high, having the highest potentials for carbon sequestration in North America. And um, according to US EPA, the forest prairies and natural habitats absorbs about uh, 12 to 15 percent of um, greenhouse gas emissions nationwide in the United States. And in Korea, that's about only about really 5.7 percent. 
So to put this in numbers, in total greenhouse gas emission in 2018 was estimated around 6.7 billion tons. And the amount of carbon removed from land uh, was nearly 800 million tons uh, on that same year. This is almost it's equivalent to the entire national um, level greenhouse gas emissions that came from um, Korea in the same year. And um, if you look at the case of Ontario's Green Belt, which is the largest land uh, preserved land in the world, uh, that they were able to preserve um, 7,500 square kilometers of forest, wetland, and farmland uh, through the Green Belt program in Canada. And um, in this study that published in 2013, um, they, uh, the researchers found that the, the screen bell was contributed to removing 86.8 million tons of carbon, uh, which is more than half of the provincial level emissions in that same year. So land preservation works and it can contribute to reducing, we need effective and land, um, in land preservation. So I had a privilege to follow up on this research with, uh, uh, with Tom, uh, which was in this study that was published last year in land use policy, Oh, and then why, why don't we look at you know green belts in 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 the United States? So there are currently six green belt counties in the United States that has adopted a green belt policy that consists of urban growth boundary, a low density agricultural zoning, and market based land preservation programs such as PDR and TDR. We want to know that what are the see, um, implementation of green belt policy has contributed to saving carbon sink potentials uh, compared to the, the neighboring counties. And it, when we were able to verify the effectiveness. So the what we've highlighted here in, in red boxes shows the, um, indicates that the Greenbelt counties uh, lost the least per capita carbon stock and flux compared to their neighboring counties without Greenbelt. So in a way, you know, we can indirectly um, um, determine that you know, green belt works and can contribute to uh, preserving carbon sinks. So green belts are effective. And this kind of shows that, you know, using data, especially considering the fact that uh, we are getting even like higher, higher resolution land cover data and more higher quality data to, uh, for, for planners to analyze, we can better understand the effects of developments on carbon sinks. And uh, when we are assess these um, effects of carbon sinks, we need to account for the geographical variation in carbon sink potentials, such as local climate, vegetation, ecosystem, and soil type. Uh, and, and I had a question, you know, whether like, the SETs, did it really help you know, us to better predict the urban growth and then its impacts on carbon sink? So the current project that I'm working on at KAIST uh, looks into this uh, very uh, question. So uh, when I was collecting data with my um, um, lab members, I found that there's a much improved um, quality of data out there um, at our disposal. This is, you know, starkingly different than when I was collecting data for my dissertation 10 years ago. Um, so we started, I had like this thoughts about you know, revisiting you know, urban growth modeling that including the curve model that John developed in years ago and urban sim model. You know, to kind of incorporate it into, along with biogeochemical modeling to assess the, um, the carbon sinks, uh, what are the, how could, it, could we use these um, sort of like a package modeling to find the optimized carbon sink preservations in urban growth scenarios? And what if we can visualize this through data visualization platforms to, to inform our communities the importance of land preservations and promoting sustainable developments? So um, I'm happy to share the, our preliminary results which are shown on the land cover um, in images here and below. What you see here in, in um, the left land cover is the land cover of the downtown Seoul in 2007. You can see, and you can see the same location in, in, in 2021. You can see here that the substantial increase of green areas in the middle. And this is what it used to be a um, U.S. Army base that was returned to the city of Seoul in, in recent years. And the Seoul city started developing that area into an urban park. So this Yongsan Park is about 741 acres, um, which can be compared to the Central Park in New York City, which is about 843 acres. So this is massive you know, urban park um, that are currently being developed, um, built 
and City of Seoul. So what you see on the right in the black and white figure is the, um, um, the, our initial results for assessing carbon stock, um, analyzed carbon stock. Um, you can see here that the creation of this particular uh, massive amount of urban park system um, has increased the carbon stock in the city of Seoul. So um, as I've mentioned, briefly mentioned in the beginning of the slides, all of these are important, but without considering the system, without system thinking, you know, fragmented implement, implementation of um, smart city technologies cannot yield significant impacts. So this is the another project that I'm currently working on at KAIST. We're trying to use this, um, the major five criteria that is known to be um, the major contributor of greenhouse gas emissions in urban scale, including energy, transportation, industry, building environment, to classify all of the uh, cities, municipal governments in, in Korea to see you know, what sort of se sectors are contributing to the greenhouse gas emission the most. So this is the preliminary results of how the digitalization looks like. Um, what you can see here in the middle is the example from Chongju city. And in this particular case, relative to other cities and regions across the country, um, the more emissions comes from transportation sector. So from which we can determine that in this, for this particular cities, they might, not, might need to strategize, come up with strategies to um, effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. So through system thinking, we think we can come up with a really effective you know, solutions, holistic and comprehensive solutions that can help you know, really decarbonize our cities and regions. Um, so now I'm going to talk about you know how we can implement this uh, effectively implement these um, ideas of decarbonizations with the use of SCT based uh, planning communications. So as I mentioned in the beginning of this uh, presentation, the digital transformation of our society has presented an opportunity. So we are seeing you know, an um, increasing number of municipal governments and planners using social media like Twitters and Facebook to engage communities and collect their inputs for, during the planning process. Um, you can see here an example of the San Antonio Tomorrow comprehensive plans, and also planners can visualize their, um, um, the uh, research uh, through effective data visualizations to inform communities. What you see here on the right is, is an app developed by one of my students. I'm showing the heat vulnerability map of City of Seoul, so which are more prone to the heat waves during, um, in case of extreme weather events. So all of these um, use, the utilization of online platforms has made the, um, presents an opportunity to make the planning process more accessible and inclusive as we have no longer bounded by space and time with the use of online platforms. And we can make the whole planning process more accessible, transparent planning, um, transparent. And therefore um, there's a potential, I argue that there's a potential for establishing effective two-way communications between the community planners and decision makers. And I believe this is a, um, uh, uh, you know, let's start to a successful plan implementations, including uh, the, the uh, achieving decarbonization goals. So um, in this paper that I published in the Environment Planning B uh, last year, I um, wanted to see if we can, you know, analyze um, the massive amount of social media data to understand uh, what are the challenges of, of uh, uh, plan implementations. So through elections and municipal elections, um, the elected officials usually communicate with the communities about the planning priorities they wanna focus on, right? Whether that's a you know, transit issue or public housing issues. And planners are the expert, we um, identify planning priorities to plans, the God of comprehensive plans, right? So from analyzing the election social media communications, as well as planning documents, I found that in the case of city of Calgary, which this uh, study was based on, affordable housing and newly planned green line public transit system, which is a light rail transit system, was the top priority in, in, in this particular city. So since the election in 2017, I tracked the Twitter communications of elected officials, which included 14 uh, city councilors and one elected mayor um, to see how they were communicating about these particular two issues and how that led to the actual implementation decisions recorded in the city council minutes. Um, so this in involved analyzing over 30,000 tweets over three years um, time span. And this is just an example of what we can, you know, the potentials of 
uh, using um, online platforms for understanding deployment implementation. What you see here in the graph shows the Twitter activities of the elected officials and a point of time when the important planning decisions were made on affordable housing and, and green light transit system. You can see here that the, when the, um, the Twitter activities of the elected officials spiked during the fiscal quarter when the important decisions were being made. So you can get the idea how useful this information can be to help people understand whether you know um, the um, whether that their elected representatives are working toward to represent their um, the constitu constituents constituents' interest. So if you think about analyzing thirty thousand tweets, you're reading every single tweet to get a sense on you know, how they were working towards um, the plan implementation. It's almost impossible, and and then because of the instantaneous nature of the tweets, it's easy to like forget like what the elected official says. What I, what I propose here is a, a framework called the Smart Planning Communication Framework that would allow us to track you know, what the elected official says over time. And then from this analyzing the patterns, for example, you see the red dots there. That shows a very strong negative sentiments by particular elected officials. Then we can zoom into that particular time period, identify the tweets, what that act, uh, elected official actually said um, during that point in time. And they understand when, you know, what, are, uh, what are likely to be that they're voting um, uh, decisions and in their final votes on uh, making decisions. So we can you know, put checks and balance uh, to kind of monitor how their elected officials are representing the needs and wants of their communities. So the prospects of a smart planning communication framework is that we can use, um, it, uh, it presents a useful analytic framework to track plan implementation from analyzing planning communication. And we can inform constituents to, and hold elected official account, uh, officials accountable if needed, and therefore it can um, help maybe contribute to empowering our communities. And I believe that this is a very important um, um, overlooked uh, elements of smart city because considering this potential to enhance planning communications to ensure successful implementation of um, various planning goals, including decarbonizations. But there's a lot of limitations, you know, starting with the fact that not everyone is on social media, and there's also a limitation of text analysis uh, method itself. And then social media can be used, as you can see in the case of Twitter, uh, be a platform to spread misinformation and disinformation. And without addressing the issues of digital divide, we can't really make the, um, truly make the whole planning process based on online platforms inclusive. So now on to the conclusion, the prospects. So I've demonstrated in my presentation today that, you know, building energy benchmarking with advanced data analytics, SAT-based advanced data analytics, as well as um, the visualizations can yield, you know, has a potential to yield positive um, impacts on decarbonizing building sector. And I'm not going to go too much on detail on transportation because I did not touch on that, but um, the studies on optimized transportation systems and how they can contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from transportation texture are well documented and studied. And for energy, um, I've demonstrated that planners can actually, we can think creatively about how we can use the underlies, underutilized space or securing space for building renewable energy infrastructure uh, to help city uh, decarbonize our cities. And for carbon sinks, I think uh, we, um, you know, the growth simulations and uh, has been out there for, you know, almost like a couple of decades now. And I think we should keep exploring the potentials for growth simulations, especially considering the, the possible impacts of various growth patterns on carbon sink potentials um, so that we can make decisions, um, make recommendations to optimize preservation of carbon sinks. And lastly, the planning communication. Um, I believe that with, if we've done right, we can use this uh, framework to achieve accessible, transparent, inclusive planning processes that are geared toward uh, decarbonization goals. And conclude the caveats, you know, um, this Sejong City, I believe it's gonna be almost impossible to replicate Sejong cities um, in anywhere without substantial investment from the government sector, which was the case for South Korea. It was only through the national government funding that was a lot of the investment um, was possible. Um, so we need to think about how we can fund those substantial increase um, the capital improvement program for decarbonizing building transportation energy sectors. And we have to continue, you know,
thinking about the good old fashioned development versus preservation, you know, debate. Uh, and when in that, in those debates, we just really think about the implications of developments on um, the loss of carbon sinks. And we need to take human-centric approach rather than tech-centric approaches, which has been a, you know, one of the uh, strong criticism against smart city approaches. Um, and we need to think you know, software is as important as hardware um, and focusing on the improving the quality of life of people living in smart cities. And we need to ensure accessibility, transparency during the decarbonization planning process with SETs. And we need to take holistic, comprehensive approaches that are based on system thinking. So I believe these are the things that are much needed um, area of studies to ensure the um, this, um, decarbonization of cities and regions. Um, and I think we, us planners have a much important role to play to um, in our fight against climate change. So that concludes my presentation and thank you for your attention. Yep, sure. Uh, negotiating the new urban agenda. Mm -hmm. The Habits Hat 3 conference and making sure that something about smart cities was put into the new yeah. urban agenda. Do you know anything about that? Um, unfortunately, I heard that from, <laughs> from, from, from me. you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, um, they were really pushing that. I mean, it was one of the uh, political agendas of uh, the previous presidents. I think, it, and now it's it shifted to carbon neutrality. Of the current under the current, um, so it, I think it was more a political surprise. I don't think it was that. industrial. I mean, it was an economic development boy too, because there's such a big industry of smart city technology. It is. It is. Yes. South Korea. In fact, why don't you talk about why Keist is where it is in Daejeon and the, the industry, the tech city, and so forth? Yes. Yeah, so for one, I think um, one of the advantages of being in an engineering school is that I get to work with engineering scientists who are developing technologies for decarbonization. So. One of the projects that I'm working on is with the, the environmental scientist who's developing technologies for reducing um, nitrogen oxide from um, agricultural lands through the use of microbiome, like microbiology. So my job working with him is to um, assess, to, the, to conduct a life cycle assessment of um, that technologies in terms of how much economic cost saving can we achieve through um, to um, making those, um, implementing those in the agricultural scale, as well as assessing the environmental cost of, uh, of reducing greenhouse gas emission from agricultural lands. Um, the another project is, you know, about um, like how to optimize the transportation system. Um, so far, I'm kind of really bringing the one who's bringing that whole decarbonization ideas into the table. So I, I hope to, you know, branch out, uh, keep collaborating with the engineers at KAIST to explore you know, what are the true potentials of uh, finding engineering solutions to reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions at sea level. Yeah. John, then Tom, I guess, John and Riz. So, uh, 10 years. Yes. Yep. There was, there was sort of a focus on um, uh, sort of dividing solutions into two. Behavioral changes, yes. like getting people out of their cars and uh, getting them to wash their clothes at night when energy was less expensive yep. and retrofit their houses, the sort of thing you were talking about with benchmarking. Uh, and then uh, technological improvements, which made the basically the grid more efficient, both mm -hmm. on the generation and the consumption side. Yeah. Um, if you look at the uh, Biden initiatives on energy, they've really gone, they've really sort of discarded the behavioral change arguments um, and in favor of improved technological efficiency, grid, grid improvements and generation improvements, electrify everything. Yeah. We really started to discuss, we, at least the policymakers have said, you know, behavioral modification didn't get us very far, won't get us very far. We just need a more efficient and uh, lower, lower emission system. Um, I don't think planners have gotten that message. Um, could you talk a little bit about how people in Korea think about the division between um, behavior modification and improved technology? And it, and it, this goes back to smart 
um, to smart technology because smart technology was going to be a big part of behavior modification. Right. You know, again, your your Nest thermostat telling you, you know, turn it down, telling you turn it down, rates are down. Um, but in the new sort of technological model, smart cities or smart technology plays a very different role, uh, having to do with basically load management across the grid. So, talk a little bit about how people in in Korea think about that. Well, um, I think thanks. I think that's a great question. Um, I my impression of the government initiatives and and the Korean policies is it's too techn technology centric. It's it's too focused on technologies. There, I mean, I, I've I met with government officials saying that you know as if the technology is solutions to everything, and I'm kind of like pushing back against that because I think. Um, a lot of the policies, you see policy geared towards that technological investments to make sure they're talking about CCUS, carbon storage technologies, right? But that's not never enough to, you know, really yield any uh, significant impacts on, I mean, effects on decarbonizing cities. And I argue that I, a lot of the presentations in, um, that I've today focus on the actual behavioral changes, including starting with the benchmarking, informing the communities, why we need to do that is to um, help um, people in the communities understand the necessity of you know participating in the greater role of uh, decarbonizations, uh, starting with you know green practices and also um, thinking about like what are the implications of you know driving basically all that good old argument. Um, I think it's a largely understood area, and then it needs to be more emphasized. And I hope to make that significant difference by conducting research, the proposed research that I've presented to you today. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's kind of the current situation in Korea, I would, I would say. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Alfred, I've been doing a lot of, thank you. I've been doing a lot of work lately on uh, solar, especially utility scale solar. And the solar projects you showed are, are really cute, uh, but they, they really don't have a whole lot of uh, capacity. Right. Um, the, the basic definition of utility scale solar is five megawatts, which is enough to power about 1200 homes. And yep. you were looking at 300 and 400 homes. And, you know, it, it adds something, um, but there are also economies of scale in, um, in solar yeah. projects. Yeah. And, and so, um, whereas I think there can be some contribution from cities, I don't think there's going to be all that much. If you look at um, you know, DOE reports here in the United States, they're expecting utility scale solar to be providing anywhere from 80 to 90% of overall solar by the year 2050. So you're going to have to, you know, have big solar arrays on, on open land, ideally fairly close to the city. So you don't lose, you know, electricity and transmission and that sort of thing. Yeah. But, but I don't, I don't see solar just, it, it, you know, as, as a big solution embedded in the city. Well, I, I guess I can explain a little bit more about the issues regarding solar panels and um, solar power in Korea. Um, it was a really strong um, initiative from the previous administration and the pre previous president really pushed hard, uh, like creating solar panels. And he created a lot of incentive programs to support um, installation of solar panels on, you know, um, the, like the farms, right, um, where they raise cattle and stuff. Um, but what that led to, uh, uh, Korea, if you think about the landscape of Korea, 70% of the country are mountain areas. It's almost undevelopable. And the, the downside of that, pushing too much on solar panel and providing too much incentive was resulted in shaving trees to build solar farms. And you can actually see that here and there. And I think you're right. I mean, to make, um, to use solar panels to generate enough um, impacts on decarbonization, it's it's it's, it's not enough. Um, so I think there was this huge like debates on, uh, on you know the effectiveness of solar panels on energy savings. And come on this administration, they brought back the nuclear power plants. Uh, whole. So I think currently um, the electricity generation grid uh, relies 40% of electricity are produced from a uh, um, uh, coal, uh, coal fire plant and natural gas fire plants in Korea, which is the largest in, in, in the world. Um, and so, in order, the current government is, is arguing that to, to get to the point, the carbon, to achieve that carbon neutrality goal by 2050, 
we need to really think hard about reducing, you know, reliance on fossil fuels for generating electricity. Um, and I think that there are some experts recognizing that solar power is not enough. It's, it's not going to be that effective. So that's that, that's why they're, they're turning to nuclear power plants, uh, similar to what Steve France has been doing, right? Um, so I think that's I think it will really be interesting to see the, how it, it plays out in the, in, in, the, in the coming years. And um, the challenge for that, I want to monitor, I want to study that. But the challenge was that getting my hands on those data, and and it's it's all that data uh, on electricity generations and power generations are owned by the national government. So there's this whole entire national grid is is, is managed by this one a national corporation called um, Kepco, and and they are they don't really share that information unless you are kind of an insider. So maybe I can become the insider one day, <laughs> get my hands on this data to get to more advanced um, in-depth analysis on the, the issues. But there are a lot of challenges in terms of energy um, in, in Korea, and uh, we export like. A majority of the energies from you know, to abroad, and then it has also raised the questions. I mean, issues with energy security issues. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, uh, we actually have some questions from the virtual audience. Okay, so I'm reading on behalf of uh, Professor Allison Lassiter. She says, Albert, thank you for your presentation. One of the aspects of smart city technologies and decarbonization that is of interest to me is enabling local governance for electricity, which you mentioned in an early slide. Could you speak to that a little more? Any thoughts on how local energy markets relate to distributed renewable deployment? She had one follow-up question if we have time. Um, it was great to hear more about smart city projects in Korea. I was intrigued by the stat you gave on 20% vacancy in Sejong. Yeah. This seems to be a problem that plagues planned smart cities, for example, Songdo. Do you have any example, sorry, do you have any thoughts on this issue of new tech focused planned cities and vacancy? Okay. Um, I think I kind of answered the first questions from answering Tom's question, the issues regarding energy. So I will just skip to the second question. Um, I think the challenge, the high vacancy rate we found in both Songdo and, and Sejong was because it was, um, when they plan for those new developments, they I really thought about the demands for uh, what people, um, the, the software part, you know, like what drives people to live there. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it, it's kind of universal in the sense that, you know, if you have a, like a kids at home, the school system matters, right? But for you to live, in that newly built place, they need to have a supporting, you know, amenity features like, you know, for entertainment, for hospitals, all that stuff. Um, but the, those are not something that you can arbitrarily relocate, right? So it has to follow. And and those, those commercials and all the amenity never mature in, in Songdo. I think that resulted in uh, uh, the high continuous uh, vacancy rate, high vacancy rates in commercial buildings. I'm afraid that's going to be the case for Sejong City for the time being, unless government you know take the initiatives on and providing you know creating more desirable um, a living environment for people to live in, in Sejong city um, without that you know it's going to be people who are going to still want to live in Seoul um, and and there are, I mean I know a number of people who just live in Seoul and just commute to jobs in in, in 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 Sejong on high street rail but they are still like using energy you know we've got getting on that express bullet train every day it, it's much consumes more energy than just, you know, walking to work every day. So there's a lot of challenges that it needs to be overcome. I think that's why um, the planning matters in Korea. And that's, how, that's why I think that the planners have a bigger role to play to, um, to yeah, to, to make that Sejong City and Songdo self-sustained so that it can really serve the true purpose of being a self-sustained city uh, with less energy footprint. Thank you. Um, great presentation. Have you, in, in uh, your research um, and in your work in Korea, has the matter and potential problem of cybersecurity and smart cities ever come up? Oh, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, cybersecurity, um, I think one of the things I think uh, the, the role of the planners in the future is, is, is a gatekeeper for data, 
right? So I mean, I think, I don't know if that's a, a security, I don't know much, but, um, I can't really speak for that because that's not my area of expertise, but you will see a lot of like false information being spread around your know, social media and online platforms. Um, and we're actually using, we now we're, I think, equipped with um, um, uh, uh, of technologies to analyze those data, like, you know, uh, the, the social media data and stuff like that. Um, I think it's going to be really more important um, for pro planners to ensure the um, the fact checking of those data being 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 produced um, by playing the role of a gatekeeper. So we need to so it's like a um, to make sure that that the uh, fact based um, empirical evidence based information are shared um, in 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 and for planning and practice and research. I think that's gonna be the issues. That, and I think um, that probably needs to accompanies, you know, education on cybersecurity too. Cause I mean, the information that that's gonna be shared needs to be secured. Um, Cause we're gonna be using more data in, in the future. So I don't know if that answered your question. I, I, I wish to have a better answer to that question but I'm not really expert in cybersecurity, so. Thanks. Um, I had a question about this idea of like uh, smart cities really being related to de demand responsiveness. Yeah. Um, but then you're also like, what's the moment where you do have to push the cart before the horse in order to um, be an impetus for adoption, right? Like somebody has to choose the technology that gets implemented so that we can start measuring things so right. that we can become demand responsive. Yeah. Um, and what is the role? How do you see the role of the city um, or local local governance in terms of like, picking winners and losers around what technologies we do and don't use. Mm. Um, and like, are we aiming for the level of like the outlet is so ubiquitous and it allows us to do a lot of things. Are we aiming for that level of ubiquity when we're talking about CSTs in cities? That's a great question. I think that's kind of ties to John's questions on your behavior changes versus technologies. Um, I think these whole demand responsive um, the technologies that are has been a huge part of smart city technologies that can, has continues to have an important role to play to um, to to promote uh, behavior changes to conserve energy in in all these sectors that I mentioned. Um, I think that's what you just mentioned is a very understudied area, and you need to uh, to answer your question. I think um, we need to conduct a comparative studies on multiple cities and, and, and multiple comparing um, cities and countries that adopt this smart city technologies for decarbonizations. And that's going to be actually be the, the proposed topic, um, a research proposal that I'm going to propose to Fenari or tomorrow, but uh, you actually were spot on on that topic. That's, that's going to be my next um, uh, research area that I'm going to, to hope to find answers to. Yeah. Jeannie. We found here in the United States after with COVID that people could work from home yep. more frequently and that custom has continued in many of our large cities. I'm wondering if you had the same experience in South Korea, in Seoul and the other cities in terms of that, whether that's whether the smart city technology is also assisting that. That's a great question that I don't have answer to. I don't think I've been in Korea long enough to um, like learn what it, what it was like to, um, you know, work from home and during the COVID. Um, I mean- the people come back in, in, in your cities? They're back in offices. Five and, days a week? Yeah. Oh. So it's, it's, I mean, I thought, you know, working from home was gonna be kind of the, the new normal for a lot of the companies, but they're just, you know, I think even during the COVID, a lot of people still commuted to the work, unless if you get tested positive, then you can take a week off. but. I think there's this general like working like environment. Maybe it's a cultural thing that your boss wants to be, he wants you to be in the office space in 24, like um, the five days a week, I guess. So I don't see that. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe in the United States, but not so much in Korea. Hello, uh, thanks for talking to us. Um, so I, I had a question. Um, they built this whole new administrative capital. I understand there's a bunch of reasons for doing it as a new 
as a way to decentralize a yep. lot of the government functions. Yep. But um, I imagine that constructing this new capital took a lot of energy through all the materials, moving all the people. Does some part of you wish that instead of investing all that energy in this whole new city, they could have um, spent a like, large sum of that on improving souls, energy use and retrofitting soul? That's a great question. I never thought of it that way, but um, have you been to Seoul? No, it's a very like super like uh, it's a mega city. And it's a very super dense, and, and housing is becoming has become you know so expensive, you know, um, and unaffordable. And you know the alternative option for the, the this whole uh, was to because of there's a strong demand to live closer to Seoul, they you know, they've been building like satellite cities outside the city of Seoul. There's this place, one new town, two new town, three new towns, all connected via um, high-speed rail system as well as uh, as um, expressways. Because um, I mean, without truly realizing uh, implementing the balanced, you know, regional like like uh, national uh, regional growth uh, economic developments, that's gonna be, uh, the cost of doing that. I think far exceeds. Um, uh, the cost of developing like like the, the new cities like Sejong, and that that's my, my don't call me on this, but that's my personal opinion. Because um, even even with all the new towns that are built, doing built on the urban periphery outside city of Seoul, thousands still remains to be very expensive. So I think, and there are a lot of lands that can be that has a potential for real estate developments in, in other regions across the country that does not have the same investment that the Seoul metropolitan um, area has been getting. So I think kind of understand where the, the government was coming from. You know, it, it could be the is only by relocating the, the public sector jobs they can they have no control over private sector jobs. Um, they can probably hoping that that will kind of you know um, initiate sort of like a regional economic development in, in, in far away from Seoul, so that can promote the balanced economic growth and and urban developments throughout the country. So I think I don't know if that answered your question, but that's yeah. So a lot of the developments, you know, leapfrog outside of region. Yes. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. A lot of things to think about. Jeannie asked me if I had any questions. I think I have about a dozen. So uh, <laughs> I'll start start with one. And that is, uh, where do you start in a process like this? I'm thinking about third and fourth tier cities, a uh, tremendous amount of potential here. But what institutional capacity do you need to start the process? Where would you start if you went into a you know, small city anywhere, what's the first, second, and third thing you'd uh, suggest that they do? And what would they, what resources would they need to do it? So you mean the, like this, applying that smart urban system for decarbonizations? That's a great question. I, 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 <laughs> so that's, I think, one of the, um, the questions I would like to solve through my new research projects. Um, I think, uh, similar to my answers to um, uh, Laura, uh, Laura, um, Laura's questions, I think we need to survey the existing smart city cases first, um, not like nationwide, and really investigate. You know, what do they have actually? What, um, what uh, was successful? What was not? To get a sense on, you know, like whether that that smart application of smart urban system is possible. So, if you find a cluster of smart cities in some part of the regions in the states or in Korea, then that could be a good start. Um, of thinking about like more holistic um, ways to um, apply smart urban system for decarbonizations. Um, but I think that's kind of the widely understood area. I mean, they might literature review on the subjects and I was not able to find any literatures that, at, that uh, looked comprehensively at that to answer that question. So um, hopefully I can report back to you in my next visit here to Philadelphia <laughs> after uh, doing that research project. <laughs> what systems? So again, you know, going back to that slides of, hopefully I can get some sense of um, what to, yeah. So after doing this national way, like surveys of decarbonizations of, of the, I mean, every city is different, right? I think I'm hoping to detect some patterns after completing this project. Um, and then, you know, can, for, I mean, every country will probably have a unique challenges. Um, every region will have a unique challenges. So in case of South Korea, I think, you know, we should, I would argue from my own um, 
observation, I think we should prioritize energy sector first, and then which will be followed by, and then buildings, um, since 2015, you know, every buildings that were built in, in, in Korea has to be super energy efficient, and they have a really strict criteria for energy efficiency in Korea. Um, so um, I think starting with energy and then building and then transportation. Um, but I think I wouldn't, I, I'll, I'll probably have a better idea once I complete this project and get a sense on the actual uh, portfolio of, 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 of carbon GHG emissions across the nation. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I just have a quick, quick, uh, question for the uh, data. Actually, I think uh, I see some of the open source data from some of your research, Twitter, Learn Cover, but do you have a more constraints with data collection? So for example, doing this greenhouse gas emission uh, study, do you have some local partners to help you with that? Um, can you repeat that uh, for the data collection, uh, uh, do you have some more uh, local partners or uh, private sections that can help you with data collection for um, more like insider studies? So, um, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, I think, you know, um, I probably have to, um, I, I do have some connection through my organ the university that I'm employed with. So I think hopefully you can use that out as opportunity to connect with the government sector as well as private sector was in charge of um, building smart cities. Um, and I think that's gonna be the, the, the part of the next project that I'm gonna be working on, you know, and, uh, reaching out to people who are in charge of uh, the smart city developments and, you know, doing inter qualitative research and uh, interviews and surveys to get a sense on, uh, to better understanding on what actually, um, what were the challenges when and what, uh, what worked and what did not work. Um, I think I will probably be able to get a lot of good insights onto like um, what is needed to to shift that focus of that smart city to decarbonization. So hopefully I can get back to you one day after completing that project. Well, Albert, this is really terrific and it's wonderful to see the beginning of a research project. And yep. we do expect you to come back next year <laughs> and tell us how you fared with I'll be happy to, yes. So thank you very much for sharing this with us and very interesting comparison from what we're doing here in the United States. And thank you. So. Yeah. Thank you very much.